Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego and today I'm delighted to be joined by Nigel Green who is outside of... Uh, Outside of Nashville, just in Kentucky, uh, on a farm in Kentucky. That just sounds like that should be a song, actually, shouldn't it? On a farm yeah, there are in Kentucky. a couple, couple songs written about that. <laughs> and uh, and in, interesting about um, uh, what Nigel does now is uh, today he he trains leaders to to. Uh, build the high performing sales teams and and as we know and as Nigel um, rightly points out it all starts with the leadership right so high performing sales teams don't just happen on their own they have to be led and they take their cues uh, from the leader and so it's a pivotal role right Nigel but let's face it one of the issues with sales leadership is that a lot of people are default into the position or promoted into the position, not because they ever wanted to be, but they were the best salesperson or something like that. And they end up with the role. And also we become, we're very restricted, if you like, in how we provide career paths to people. Like we just go, oh yes, your next step up has to be managing people as opposed to you're fantastic at what you do, like keep going and let's figure out how we do that for you. So um, just, just to start off, um, you're dealing with a group of people of different ranges of whether they, you know, wanted the job, whether they have the talent for the job. And, and obviously you often come in because they're never trained properly for the job. Correct. And so you, you said something earlier uh, that I wanted to, to go back to and that the, the idea that some sales leaders are promoted into the job because they were a great seller. Well, if you're in sales leadership, one of the kind of the quids that we often throw around is you're only as good as your worst rep. Well, I, what I tell my sales leaders, you're only as good as your worst person. And sometimes you're only as good as you. And so sometimes you take your best rep and you put them into a sales leadership position. And now all of a sudden they're the worst person on your team because they are now tasked with telling everyone else how to do their job. And they have no framework, no process, no structure and they can't teach, they can't coach, and now the team will fail because your leader's gonna fail. Yeah, and, and uh, you, you published a book uh, a couple of years ago, Revenue Harvest, a sales leader's almanac for planning the perfect year. So uh, what are some of the things that leaders need to learn uh, in order to not just you know plan a perfect year, but to start to build that high performing team? What, what, are, some of the, what are some of the skill sets and focus areas that they should be um, looking at? Well, I think they need to recognize that hitting your number year in and year out is not going to be accomplished through some type of technology or fad or some type of gimmick. But in fact, it, it takes structure, it takes rigor, it takes planning, it takes accountability, and none of that's sexy. And so a lot of sales leaders don't want to do that because it, it's not new, it's not innovative, and it's kind of boring. But the reality and the reason why I wrote the book and, and Revenue Harvest is written from the perspective of a farmer or an agrarian, that farmers year in and year out have to produce a crop. And every year they're faced with things that they cannot control, like not enough rain, too hot, too yeah. cold, droughts. They can't control the price. And sales leaders have a lot of uncertainty and a lot of things that they can't control. The difference between sales leaders and farmers is that if you're a farmer and there's no crop, you're not a farmer. If you're a sales leader and there's no harvest, you can still <laughs> pose yourself as a sales leader. And I'm, I'm trying to eliminate the posers by saying, well, if there's no harvest, you really can't be a sales leader. And we can lean on our friends in the farming community and do these seven principles really well. And you'll hit your number year in and year out. Yeah, and and I think I think it's a it's amazing because uh, the ten year or at least the last stat that was created on that is the ten years like fifteen months or something like that, for your average uh, sales leader sales manager and 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 oftentimes it's because of that it's because they they just wash out because they are in a position that they're ill prepared ill prepared for and as you said Nick they're now the worst player on the team because they're the most ill prepared for their for their position. Um, but what are what are just taking a step back for a moment then 
what are the what what's can you give me an idea of the framework that you help these sales leaders with creating and, and what are just pick out some of the important most important parts of that well most of them would tell you that they're really good at planning john and they say i've got a great plan i know how to build a budget and i got a spreadsheet for it and everyone i look at john it goes up and to the right month over month well when i go in and look at it i say well miss sales leader you didn't account for the fact that your number one rep was going to leave right in the most unfortunate time. Yep. You didn't account for a global pandemic. You didn't account for this distributor leaving and signing a new agreement with one of your competitors. They don't plan for a worst case scenario. Everything is Pollyanna. And so one, one of the first things that I beat sales leaders up on is, you know, adversity is going to happen. So why don't you account for it? Uh, and the other thing that they do relative to planning is they just assume that everyone else understands that the plan needs to be this way for what reason? They don't tie the plan down to something that's important to the individuals that have to go execute the plan. And so in my book, I, I talk about not only the, the necessity of accounting for adversity, but the importance of it does, even if you account for adversity, it doesn't matter if you don't get your team to understand how to execute the plan and why they should. And then, then the book gets really tactical and a lot of basics around prospecting, managing accounts, closing business. And then I, I close the book with probably what I think what is one of the most controversial principles in the books, and that's this element of restoration. And farmers understand that when you harvest a crop, you've depleted that ground from a certain number of essential nutrients in order to grow something the next year but sales leaders don't understand that when you run a team ragged for 11 and 12 months they're broken down and they just expect that come january you give them a new quota that's 30 percent higher and last year they're ready to charge and there's a very different component to restoration and rest they think well we give them a holiday or they get vacation well rest john means to not use Restoration means to restore it back to its original state. And a lot of sales leaders just don't do that. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a fascinating point that you raised there because I think uh, it, it's obviously it resonate with a lot of people that idea, I mean, you push and push and push at the end of the year to either make your number or maybe you've made it and you're in accelerators, but you're pushing like crazy. And you know, most uh, salespeople, particularly if their companies are on calendar years, uh, they're working right up to the end of the year and then turn around and start again. And there is, there is no, there is no break really. And there is no restoration. And you're right. So you go from the intensity of, we got to close this year, you know, really, we got to close as strong as we can. And then two days later on January, whatever it is, second or third, we got to start the year as strong as we can. And so it's just, it's just a continuum of pressure. Well, there's no break. And then there's no recognition that the people that just delivered you the plan are broken right they've been running like like in farmers they change the oil they change the tires they go in and we don't do any of that with our salespeople. and so if you're a sales leader you're listening to this buddy you got to stop and you got to build in sometime in the year some how do you get better how do you work on your mental health how do you work on some skill set that that we can pay for that prepares you for something that's next in this career like if you don't do that, you're just, I mean, well, frankly, you're going to lose this, the talent war that we're all in the midst of because they're going to leave and go work for someone that's willing to do that. But So like the, the baseline is like now you have to understand that people require you take care of them. Yeah, and I think that's and I think that's one of the biggest challenges uh, that has come out even of the pandemic, because I think for the first time, a lot of people spent a little bit of time with themselves, which is. I think a good thing, you, you know, it's sad that we needed a pandemic for people actually to, to spend a little time with themselves. And I think that there's a lot of reevaluation going on. You know, we hear about the great resignation and all that stuff. Um, I hate all those cliches, but the fact is that I think there is a lot of shifting going on. And I think as a leader, if you're not ready to actually start to address the issues, like you just said, like, you know, wealth, um, you know, mental welfare, mental health, all of those things and, and burnout and that is you're right. People now feel like they have a lot more flexibility to 
because you can remote work and especially if your job is that kind of job where you can you you can work for anybody from anywhere so if you're not looking after your people they're going to vote with their feet which they're doing yeah no no doubt about it and so i i think that the challenge for executives is that you've got to fix the sales leadership problem and you said it earlier it's 15 months so if if you don't fix that problem there's you don't have a chance at fixing the frontline salesperson that's dealing with burnout and mental health or the fact that they're they've hit a glass ceiling or they're not earning enough money because you're you're just focused on that revolving door that's always open that's in your sales leadership role yeah. And it's funny, uh, uh, you know, with your with your, you know, your, your farming analogies and that, as you were talking about, like farmers know how to rotate crops and rotate fields and all of that. And they know when when they need to set something aside to, to replenish it. But that's you know, that's kind of counterculture, as you said, to to how we operate, particularly in, in, in corporate America. And from a sales leadership point of view, what what do we often do, as you said, like we look at existing accounts and say, okay, let's see, we can squeeze squeeze ten percent more revenue out of this account, and it may end up being, as you said, is you're just you're diminishing returns because you're focusing on something that's being tapped out or needs a new strategy. Well, you just pointed on something new that that I failed to mention earlier that I talk about in the book that it's not only do you have to restore your team because you've run them ragged, you also have to replenish and restore your customers. So you've asked them to spend, depending on your, your sales cycle and your business, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, and you're coming up on that renewal, and yet you've made no replenishing or reinvestment effort into that business whatsoever. And they're sitting here saying, what, what's the value? And so a lot of sales leaders just gloss over it. They expect, they feel entitled to the renewal without doing the work of assessing what did we do in the work of our customer and in their business and in their life that has made them better. And if you can't, if they can't measure that, don't expect the renewal. Yeah, and I think and I think that's such a such a critical point that you make there because I do think that is is overlooked and particularly when you're into uh you know recurring revenue businesses like that you know where you have a renewal date and it's fine you get over the renewal date and you're like great great customers renewed and it's okay now I don't have to worry about that for another you know whatever 10 months 11 months yeah 11, 11 months 10 or yeah. 10 11 months uh and you're right and then and then you get then you get uh, uh blindsided when the person when they decide not to re, uh, not to renew or they say actually we've been unhappy for months uh and it's that piece and I, I agree with you i don't think that part that part is built in about exhausting customers i don't think anybody's ever thought about that are you are you serving your customers are they exhausted did they get what they needed do they need you to engage with them beyond you know just whatever product or service you're selling them because let's face it products are are certainly perspe um, uh, perceived as commoditized so how you treat people is very important it it comes back to and it's nothing new john it was written for my first exposure to it was 1994 in the book the new success the new successful large account management almost 30 years ago written by um, Miller Hyman. They talk about the buy sell hierarchy and vendors, whatever you're selling. If you want to enjoy retention, you have to not only provide a good product or service, but you have to make a meaningful contribution into the organization and the business, which means they have to see an ROI that it, as you talked about, the perception is always in the eyes of the customer far outweighs the expense burden the money that they're giving your business and a lot of companies just don't look at it that way yeah no, 100 uh, percent so um in the last little bit here nigel if i'm if i'm sitting out here and i'm considering that maybe sales leadership is the way i want to go um what would you say to somebody like that what would they sh what should they be looking at in themselves to see whether this is really something i want to do and what gaps should they be looking at that maybe i need to fill in order to put myself in the best position possible well the one one thing that i start with is do you love helping people if you don't like helping people don't do it because the role of a sales leader is coaching and training individuals if you're a top performer 
and your MO is I'm going to get the deal done at whatever expense and you leave a wake of destruction behind you for everyone else to sort out, buddy, this ain't for you. But if you really care about training and developing people, then go for it. The second thing I, I would say is you got to get some equity stake in the business because your cash compensation is going to be less than what your top performer is making right now. And you need to be okay with that because you're building a business that is collectively for every dollar that's saved might pay you five to $6 at a future in a payout. And you, you need to understand how those economics work, but you need to be prepared in the short term to make concessions on your lifestyle so that it's someday in the future, you get this windfall. And then I think the third thing is you have to be insatiably curious because so much of where leaders fall short is they know everything. And the leaders that are successful recognize that as their island of knowledge grows, so does their ocean of ignorance. And I think the insatiable leader that's willing to concede on economics on the short term for a long-term win and recognizes that it's, I'm building a we, not me, they win every time. Yeah, those are those are uh, fant fantastically insightful points and, and great information for people, because I do think you really have to ask yourself whether you really want this job. And the point that you raised there about, you know, helping people coaching, coaching, again, is not something that comes very naturally to people. Uh, a lot of people don't understand what coaching really is. A lot of people's last experience of coaching was somebody standing on a sideline shouting at them. Um, and they think, okay, well, if I just, as you said, if I'm a top performer and I just say, hey, Nigel, here's what you do. Just do what I did. And then I tell you what I did. And I, I probably can't even explain to you what I did in order because a lot of people are uh, what's this, unconsciously competent and they can't actually tell you what they're doing to be successful. Um, but it's just like, just follow what I'm doing and everything will be good. Um, and so I think the whole idea of coaching and understanding how to coach is so critical. Absolutely. No, no doubt about it. There, there's an art. I, I actually, I call it a craft. I, I, I misspoke. There's a science to it and there's an art to it, but it's a craft. It's an amalgamation of the two because there, it, there's, it's very scientific and like you got to understand psychology. And then there's the art and that knowing when to use certain scientifically proving interventions to work on someone to get the outcome that they want and you want. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, Nigel, this has been fantastic. And all of Nigel's information is going to be below this video. Uh, but before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and your business. Well, my business is really simple. I coach best in class sales leaders. If, if you find yourself leading a team and you want to grow and you want to take that next leap in leadership, I can help you. Uh, if you want to, if you're not sure about hiring me and you want to learn more about me, you can go to therevenueharvest.com. You can get my book for a whopping $5. You can get the digital book and the audio book, and you can listen to me talking in your ear for five hours. Well, fantastic. Uh, I would encourage people to go check it out because I'm telling you, I, I'm totally in agreement with Nigel, though. Your biggest revenue multiplier is your sales leaders. And if you fix that, if you focus on that, you will get and they can then develop their teams, you will get a much greater you know, return than if you just focus down on the salespeople without focusing on the sales leader. All right. Well, listen, thanks again, Nigel. Thank you all for watching and listening. And I'll see you all again really soon. Thank you.